in the last lecture, we looked at Maxwell's equations in free space and we studied the solution in great detail. What we did in order to simplify our life was to study a class of solutions, which I will call monochromatic plane wave. The solutions comprised of waves of a given frequency, which are traveling along a given direction. So, what we did was to characterize the wave in terms of a, of a frequency omega and a wave number k and we derived the relation omega equal to k c. Even more importantly, we found that the electric field, the magnetic field and the direction of propagation, which I shall denote by n form an orthogonal basis. Of course, I have to replace the electric and the magnetic field by their unit vectors. Anyway, we understand that they form an orthogonal basis. And not only that, we also found that if you fix the direction of the propagation, then E cross B, the cross product of the electric field vector with the magnetic field vector will be parallel to N. That is, the cross product will give me the direction of propagation. That is what we found out. What we then did was to proceed to find out the most general solution for E, because if you know the solution for E, you also know the solution for B. And we found that the electric field is in general elliptically polarized. elliptically polarized and we have E x square over E naught square plus E y square over E 1 square is equal to 1 for all times. So, if you trace the locus of these points, what do we get? We get the elliptic polarization. Of course, if either E naught or E 1 is equal to 0, you get the linear polarization and if E naught equal to plus minus E 1, then you get the left circular polarization or the right circular polarization. All these are very, very familiar to us from optics. Maybe I should also supply one more missing step. What I did was to write E x is equal to E naught cos k z minus omega t and write E y to be E 1 sin k z minus omega t. In writing this expression, we have made intelligent use of the orientation of the axis, x, y axis and also the origin of time and the z. Okay, that is what we have done and it is a very trivial thing to evaluate this fellow. So, if you look at these two expressions, let us say E 1 equal to 0, this implies linear polarization parallel to x axis. E not equal to 0 implies linear polarization parallel to y axis and E not equal to E 1 gives you right circular polarization, E not equal to minus E 1 gives you the left circular polarization. So, all the polarizations are contained in this and this is precisely what the experimentalists starting from Young, Fresnel, Arago, Fizeau, all these people a large number of experimentalists had seen this. There was no clue to the understanding of the origin of this polarization. What Maxwell's equations tells us is that if it is indeed true that what we call as optical phenomena are actually electromagnetic phenomena, the polarization is nothing but the direction of the electric field. Of course, when I tell you that the polarization is nothing but the direction of the electric field, there is a certain convention because it is entirely up to us whether we want to choose the electric field or the magnetic field because they are not independent of each other. Giving me the electric field is equivalent to giving me the magnetic field. Giving me the magnetic field is equivalent to giving the electric field. So, it are perfectly equivalent. They are on the same footing. Okay? There is nothing to prefer one over the other. And as I told you by convention, we choose the direction of the electric field to characterize the polarization of electromagnetic waves. What have we found so far? 
what we have found so far is a certain plausibility argument in the senses speeds match polarizations match and as i will show you in a short while maybe at the fag end of this lecture there was another very very fundamental observation which the experimentalists had made and that was that if you had two waves with opposite polarizations there is no interference that is something that cannot be understood from the corpuscular theory of light that we will understand very easily by superposition principle if i write e equal to e1 plus e2 let me write that down if i write e equal to e1 plus e2 what is my interference term my interference term is nothing but e1 dot e2 and this will be zero if e1 is perpendicular to e2 right if e1 is perpendicular to e2 so let me write it properly and this was another fundamental observation which people had done the experimentalists had done and there was not a clear understanding as to how this comes about but this is a very natural consequence of maxwell's equation so you see there is an overwhelming evidence in favor of identifying light with a part of the electromagnetic spectrum but then if that is indeed true the property of light should be a universal property of electromagnetic spectrum that is i should be able to generate and detect waves which are beyond the visible spectrum okay you should go to the infrared you should go to the ultraviolet you should be able to generate wavelengths you should be able to measure the frequencies you should be able to verify lambda nu equal to c it is only then that we can claim that we have clearly identified provided complete evidence for the fact that or the for the surmise that the what we call as light is nothing but a part of the electromagnetic spectrum and who are the main experimentalists responsible for demonstrating this very very crucial piece of information as i told you the first name is that of hertz and the second name is jc bose both of them are very great experimentalists in their own right hertz did a large number of experiments all of you know and the unit of frequency is in his honor and jc bose himself did enormous number of experiments in electricity magnetism radio antenna he anticipated marconi in fact he preceded marconi probably he should have got the credit and that is a realization which has come in the last 10 years people have resurrected people have restored to him the honor and the credit that was due him okay jc bose further went on to even study the response of what plants to various electromagnetic waves etc etc so he was a pioneer in many many areas he was far ahead of his time even if we now take a skeptical view point about his work on the demonstration so called demonstration of life in plants there are other experiments which people had glossed over but today they have been as i told you duly recognized for whatever his work is so what i will do is to spend a little bit of time try to explain to you how jc bose was actually able to demonstrate what that what we call as light is nothing but a part of the electromagnetic spectrum before do do that probably here is a very good nice picture which tells you all that i have told you in words i was drawing pictures you know but here is a nice thing so you have the concept of the wavelength the electric field is along this particular direction so let me make a few things if i call it as the z direction so probably i should use some color thing if i call this z this will be the x direction this will be the y direction you people can see in this picture that the propagation direction is z the electromagnetic wave is propagating along this particular direction the polarization is along the x direction you see that the polarization is along the x direction it is oscillating this is an instantaneous snapshot at a given time so as you keep on moving along z at a given time this is how it looks like the electric field shows a sinusoidal behavior in the z x plane whereas if you look at the magnetic field direction which is along the y direction you show a you see a sinusoidal behavior are you seeing that in the plane perpendicular in the yz plane that is what you are finding and the propagation is z so here you have a complete picture of whatever i was trying to tell you nice picture and this is exactly what we want to demonstrate okay in other regions beyond the visible spectrum visible spectrum so here you have a picture of uh, jagadish chandra bose with his apparatus where he was doing experiment in presidency college 
So, we will let try to know a little bit more about the kind of experiments that he did and how he managed to actually produce and detect the waves. These are really remarkable experiments and the first one shows a transmitter of the waves. Is that okay? So, how do you transmit? First of all, you have to produce the electromagnetic wave. How do you produce light? For example, you have a spark plug. So, as you keep on bringing them together, then it reaches a point of dielectric break a breakdown and that dielectric breakdown immediately there is a charge which jumps from one electrode to another, there is a radiation that is produced, that is the principle behind you know ignition. We did discuss that when we were looking at dielectric media, electrostatics and dielectric media. So, the next picture actually shows the spark gap in the transmitter. So, he was able to arrange the gap such that enough energy will be produced, uh, supplied so that you can produce radiation not just in the visible spectrum, but in the microwave spectrum micrometer okay in the micrometer spectrum you see the gap here fine now this is a very remarkable set apparatus that he had in fact this is the one that was there in his uh, portrait so here you can see he has the complete setup you have the radiator which emits the radiation there is a spectrometer there is a mirror okay he had totally reflecting prisms jagdish chandra bose actually performed very pioneering experiments on the evanescent waves and those of you who will study a little bit of more of modern physics in semiconductor physics, okay, you will hear a word called tunneling. Okay, that is something that he demonstrated for the first time. And then of course, you have the receiver, rheostat, galvanometer, everything is sitting here. Is that okay? So, there is such a nice apparatus, a very simple apparatus. What is it that he was able to detect? Jagadish Chandra Bose fabricated his own receiver. So, this is made of a large number of spiral springs which will actually respond to the electromagnetic wave in that particular wavelength the micro micrometer and here is a very beautiful polarization apparatus. Okay. So, this is the radiating box source of the radiation and this is in the microwave region by the way. So, it is not in the visible region and what you have is a polarizer and an analyzer. So, this is a polarizer and this is an analyzer. Of course, you need a receiving antenna. I will show you a receiving antenna in a while. So, you should be able to actually perform experiments. You have a polarizer and an analyzer. If the polarizer and the analyzer are crossed with respect to each other, what should you receive? You should receive no radiation at all. That is the principle that you have always followed in optics. If the polarizer and the analyzer are parallel to each other, then you should receive half the intensity of the radiation that is coming, assuming that the radiation is unpolarized. So, what Jagadish Chandra Bose did was to build a very simple apparatus, analog of the what? The optical apparatus that you have lenses and things like that, except that you cannot use a glass lens, you have to need appropriate metallic uh, receivers or the detectors. And now, let us get a glimpse of what he did. Now, this is the kind of grating that he used in order to create polarized light. Remember, I gave you a very interesting problem of what I said there is a frame and they will put a large number of wires which act as a polarizer. Okay. Now, what is it that Jagdish Chandra Bose did? You should remember that the resources were extraordinarily limited during those days. It was the days of the colonial rule and one had to be very, very innovative. Whether it was Bose or Raman, what they did was to make up for the lack of resources by their sheer talent innovation okay, by their creativity. So, what you would see here is a bundle of Indian Bradshaw. Indian Bradshaw is a huge timetable consisting of all possible railway uh, timings, okay, northern zone, eastern zone, northeastern zone. Okay. It is easily one of the thickest books that is published by probably the government of India. Okay. What J. C. Bose did was to take sheets of Indian Bradshaw and pl place metallic sheets in between them. Is that part clear? So, the paper sheets will be the dielectrics, the metallic sheets will be the analogs of the metallic wires. This is a very, very beautiful grating and I will leave it as a problem for you people because you people have studied gratings quite a lot. You find out what should be the spacing between successive metallic plates if you want it to act in the microwave region. Not only that, he went even further actually to use twisted jute coils. Is that okay? Twisted jute coils. You see that these are all twisted in order to actually polarize microwave radiation. Jute of course, is very bad if you try to polarize what? The radiation in the visible spectrum, but J C Bose was able to do that 
and we should remember that all these materials act as excellent antenna they act as polarizer they act as receivers and those of you who stay in some remote corners of the country you may remember that if you don't get an antenna and if you have a tv set you can simply take your cable and connect it to a banana plant that will already start receiving radiation or whatever the signal that is required for your tv receiving is that okay so it is the same principle that was used by jc bose when he started looking at the receivers if you think that jc bose was all the time using some rudimentary okay some primitive uh, detectors and receivers then you are wrong because for the first time jc bose also used semiconductor receivers you people will study a whole lot of semiconductor physics because all of electronics is based on them and one of the things that you know in semiconductor physics is that the so called vi characteristics voltage current characteristics let me spend a few minutes on that when we looked at conduction in an ordinary wire what is it that we wrote v out v equal to i r for a metal for a conductor that means the voltage current characteristic is a linear relation whereas the voltage current characteristic in a semiconductor is not linear at all in fact it starts like this and it starts saturating you see that in electronics and transistors in triodes in semiconductors because all of them are built out of semiconductors and jc bose was the first person to study these characteristics the current voltage characteristics see the non linear relation between the current and the voltage so what is happening here what is happening here is that the resistance itself is dependent on the current that is flowing the resistance is not independent of the current that is flowing it is a non linear response it is not linear it is linear only in this narrow region jc bose was able to study that and mot a great physicist makes the observation that bose was perhaps at least 30 years ahead of his contemporaries because it was only 30 years later when transistors proper were fabricated and discovered that all these studies came to their fore okay so now we have seen that there is an experimental demonstration thanks to hertz thanks to jc bose where we are able to verify actually all the properties of light even in the invisible region okay so what do we have we have the complete electromagnetic spectrum which this picture shows so where is the visible spectrum in fact the visible spectrum is barely visible you can see that light bulb is what they indicate so let me circle it with some appropriate color okay so this is where you have the visible spectrum okay that has been bloated up whereas if you look at the all the wavelengths and all the frequencies um, that have been so far seen so far you start with something like 10 to the power of 6 hertz all the way up to 10 to the power of 20 hertz that is what is shown in this particular figure okay whereas the visible spectrum you know is in something like 10 to the power of 14 to 10 to the power of 15 okay that is one order of magnitude right between 10 to the power of 14 and 10 to the power of 15 cycles per second hertz whereas here you are going from 6 to 20 14 decades is that okay that is what people have seen and invariably from the very very large wavelength that is very very small frequencies to very very large frequencies 10 to the power of 20 hertz okay what we find is that electromagnetic waves are transverse e and b are perpendicular to each other okay the direction of polarization is given by e you can see polarization you can see interference you can see diffraction in all these regions the challenge is not so much in the physics as in the technology you should have the talent to actually fabricate the right sources the right polarizers the right detectors and it is a great triumph of modern technology that these things can be seen okay so there is a whole lot of thing this is the radio wave this is my radio wave region okay so and here you have the gamma rays at the other end which come from the emission of what the nuclei when the nucleus gets de excited from a higher energy level to lower energy level it will emit radiation in the million electron volt range so that will be your gamma rays you can also have hard x rays and soft x rays coming from atoms and molecules okay you can actually prepare beams of light which travel okay which uh, beams of light which travel at very very small frequencies at with very uh, at very very large frequencies at very very small wavelengths you can polarize them 
you can scatter them against the electron, you can scatter them against the atom, study the final state polarization. So, whatever you do in optics can be mimicked all across the wavelength. If that is indeed the case, then from the viewpoint of physics, it is entirely a matter of mild interest that there is something called a visible spectrum. By virtue of evolution, our eyes and our brain have adopted, adapted themselves to a very narrow range. So, this is a narrow range, maybe I should use another color, more visible, narrow range of the spectrum, because we have to live and survive, we have to be sensitive to the dominant wavelengths that enter the earth's atmosphere and please remember, not all the wavelengths emitted by sun can actually enter the earth's atmosphere because of the ionosphere. There is a natural shielding because of which the ultraviolet rays cannot easily penetrate. All of you know the problem of ozone hole today, because of the ozone hole, ultraviolet rays are not shielded anymore and people who live very near the poles are susceptible to skin cancer because of that. It is a very big environmental problem because of all our refrigerators, etcetera, etcetera. So, this is the narrow region, but if we want to explore electromagnetic waves through the complete spectrum, then we should be able to go, able to go beyond, much beyond the optical region. Okay. Now, here is a very beautiful picture made by the NASA people who actually explore the space. What they do is to ask, suppose I want to see more and more regions of the spectrum, how far should I go about my ground level? Of course, eventually if you can go to the outer space where there is no atmosphere, then you should be able to see all possible spectra. So, this is the height that we are interested in. So, you are shown here 3, 6, 12, 25, etcetera units of kilometers and you go all the way up to 400 kilometers. Let us not forget that our atmosphere is about 300, 400 meters. If you go to 400 kilometers, you will be able to access radio, microwave, infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, etcetera. And today, we know that our telescopes, earlier Newton built the great refracting telescope, Herschel made his measurements with the observations with telescope. Okay. Today's telescopes are not restricted to visible light. Today's telescopes are there in the infrared. There is the great radio astronomy center, which is in India. Okay. There is the radio astronomy center, radio waves. Then we have it in the microwave region, cosmic microwave background. All of you have heard of it, which is the remnant of the Big Bang explosion that took place. And there are also telescopes in the region of ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. You have to build them. There are what are called as giant gamma ray bursts. Is that okay? The sources are all quite mysterious and you have to build a receiving antenna in order to see that. So, in order to do that, perhaps it is always better to place your telescopes somewhere up in the space. So, in fact, we have dedicated satellites. Okay. Hubble teles uh, a telescope is very well known. There is another satellite named after the great Indian astrophysicist Chandrasekhar that also is carrying a telescope. So, Maxwell has done immense service after he wrote the equations not only was he able to unify optics and electromagnetics, is that okay? Optics is but a branch of electrodynamics. It has used, it has proved to be the most important tool in order to explore the universe and that is something that this picture gives us. Okay. So, now we have a complete picture of electromagnetic waves. We know that what we call as light is but a part of the electromagnetic wave. What I will now do before I proceed? is to actually look at okay, the phenomenon of interference more for the sake of completeness. We have almost reached the fag end of the course and we do not have the luxury of time to actually spend a lot of time discussing interference, diffraction, gratings, etcetera, etcetera. What I want to emphasize is something slightly different, namely the compatibility, the consistency of electromagnetic waves both with relativity and quantum mechanics. Now, I am not able to actually derive the expressions for you, because deriving an expression for the energy density is a little bit of work. You, can, you people can look up any nice book on electrodynamics, Griffith for example, will give you a very good derivation. So, what I will do is just quote for you the result and make you some interesting observations. Fine. What we shall do is to start with an expression for the energy stored in an electromagnetic field. The energy stored in an electromagnetic wave. Okay. 
I am not interested in writing down the most general solution, but I am interested in looking at a particular case, namely the monochromatic plane wave. Okay, what would be the solution? The answer is that we are not interested in the total energy, but the energy density. So, this is my energy density. This is nothing but epsilon naught mod e square. When I am writing this, I am not interested in the temporal part. What I do is to average over one particular period. So, this E is actually the amplitude. What do I mean by that? For example, if I wrote E is equal to E naught cos k z minus omega t into unit vector x, I am looking at actually this E naught. I have averaged. I do the modulus square root of that and average over a period and what I get is epsilon naught mod E squared. This is the energy density. Of course, radiation carries energy density and in some sense, sun is the source of all possible energy that we find on this earth. Photosynthesis, few fossil fuel, whatever we may look at, right? all of them owe their origin to whatever is coming from the sun. Even our waterfalls which run on hydroelectric power are because of sun's rays, because what happens? Water evaporates, becomes clouds and it rains and then it becomes rivers and then it flows down a gradient etcetera, etcetera. So, sun is indeed the source of all power, all energy that we have on the surface of the earth. And how is the sun the source? Sun is the source because of the radiation that is emitted and this is the energy density that is carried. Now, not only does the light carry energy, it also carries momentum. Okay? Now, let me write down the expression for the momentum and let me call it as pi. Okay? This is the momentum density. the momentum carried per unit volume. Okay, This is also averaged and this turns out to be epsilon naught by c into mod e square, which is nothing but u by c. This is quite a remarkable expression. So, what I will do is to rewrite that expression. So, we have u is equal to pi c. Let us remember that in order to explain, in order to account for photoelectric effect, photoelectric effect, it is always good to go back to these fundamental experiments. Einstein broke away from this beautiful edifice that we have constructed. It is an unbelievably beautiful formalism, Maxwell's equations, electromagnetic waves, right? and then light as an electromagnetic wave, wave nature, etcetera, etcetera. And yet, with remarkable boldness, Einstein was able to break away from that and then Einstein argued that electromagnetic waves actually comes in what? Quantized in units of energy and what is it that he wrote? He said that if you give me a frequency nu, a quanta of energy carries an energy h nu. So, each photon is the energy carried by each photon. Okay. Let me go back to the previous slide. Here I wrote E equal to E naught cos k z minus omega t into x and when I looked at the total energy carried, it was dependent on only E naught, it was independent of the frequency because in all waves, the energy is dependent on the amplitude and it is not dependent on either the wavelength or the frequency. But here you have a peculiar situation where Planck used it in, in order to explain black body radiation and Einstein used it very boldly and asserted that photons are real. Planck actually had somewhere in his mind that photons are some kinds of effective descriptions. He did not take them too seriously. In fact, Planck introduced the idea of a photon very reluctantly, but Einstein embraced it wholeheartedly and he asserted that h u is the energy carried by each photon. Now, that does not mean we are going to give up all the expressions that we have derived in Maxwell's equations. We are going to reinterpret them. How we are going to reinterpret the conclusions and the expressions that we derived from Maxwell's equation is the great transition from the classical physics to quantum physics. Okay. 
Now, of course, we are not going to get into that discussion, but let us ask ourselves, suppose I admitted this kind of a corpuscular picture. This corpuscular picture should not be confused with the picture that Newton had. Okay? They are entirely different from each other. If you look at that, what my energy density would be will be nothing but the number density multiplied by the frequency. Because I have looked, I am looking at an electromagnetic wave which is monochromatic, all of them have the same frequency. Therefore, I will write u is equal to n h nu, where n is the number density of the photons. Actually, I should be careful here, I should say mean number density, but anyway, let us not bother too much about that. Now, if this is the number density, what about the momentum? Each photon carries a certain momentum, p equal to h by lambda, for example, that is the de Broglie wave. Therefore, if I look at it now, what is it that I am going to get? I am going to get n h nu is equal to n into momentum carried by each photon into c, that is what we have. So, n h nu is simply given by n into p into c and let us not forget the meaning of c, which is the speed of light. Very good. So, what I will do is to look at this equation again, n h nu is equal to n p c, n cancels. Now, this gives me the energy carried by the each photon and also momentum carried by each photon. So, this implies energy carried by each photon E gamma, let me use that notation, is nothing but P gamma into C. The relation between the energy and momentum is given by a linear relation E gamma equal to P gamma C. At this point, it is a good thing to pause to ask ourselves why we should be looking at this kind of an equation. So, let us recall what is it that happens in the Newtonian case. In the Newtonian case, we wrote my energy carried by a particle is given by P squared by 2 m. Is that right? This is the kinetic energy carried by a particle. So, obviously, this relation is incompatible with this. So, this is the famous Newtonian relation, which you used extensively in your dynamic course. Now, when Einstein developed this relativity, now we are going away from quantum mechanics Planck to relativity. Einstein gave a refinement of this formula. So, what is my relativistic formula? That is nothing but m naught c squared over root of 1 minus v squared by c squared. This is the expression for energy. This is what is called as Einsteinian relation. If you make a Taylor expansion power of v, what do we get? We get m naught c squared plus half m v squared, so on and so forth. So, with a great boldness, Einstein was able to identify this with the rest energy. And this is the famous mass energy transmutation. You people have studied that in your 12th standard E, which shows up as mass defect, production of uh, gamma particles, etcetera, etcetera. So, this is the Einsteinian relation. Now, what Einstein did was not only give a relativistic expression for energy, he also gave a relativistic expression for momentum. So, let me repeat. So, E is given by m naught c squared over root 1 minus v squared by c squared, whereas the momentum is given by m naught v over root 1 minus v squared by c squared. If you make a Taylor expansion in power of v, a binomial expansion, the leading order term will be m naught v m naught is the so called rest mass. Now, I want to do a little bit of algebra, which I will leave it as an exercise for you people. It is a pure entertainment and I would like you to see how the thought processes take place. When you derive these expressions, all of you are familiar with these expressions, you will find that if I put the rest mass is equal to 0, m naught is equal to 0 energy is equal to 0, momentum is equal to 0, no mass, no energy, no momentum. However, what I can do is to recast the above equations, is that right, recast the above equations in a slightly different form. So, exercises for use to recast the above equations. 
and how do i recast the above equation i want you to eliminate v and write e as a function of p so that is the exercise eliminate v squared and write e as a function of p after all we wrote e equal to p squared by 2m what would that be let me write down the answer for you and that is the exercise that you will work out e squared is nothing but p squared c squared plus m not squared c to the power of 4 this is an identity and where did i get this equation from if i put a star here star implies this particular relation now what einstein did was to argue that although let me call it as a double star although i use star in order to divide a double star speaking figuratively i will give it a five star status e squared equal to p squared c squared plus m not squared c to the power of 4 i will treat it as a fundamental expression and not as a derived expression so treat it as a fundamental expression fundamental expression if you did that now we are under no obligation to go back to my original equation this star i can choose m not to be a free variable so in particular we can treat m not to be a free variable in particular put m not equal to 0 if you put m not equal to 0 what happens the original expression tells you e equal to 0 p equal to 0 because e is proportional to m not p is proportional to m not but in this equation e squared is equal to p squared c squared plus m not squared c to the power of 4 if you put m not equal to 0 this term cancels this term cancels and you got e equal to p c but what does mr planck tell us which was actually used by einstein in his photoelectric effect planck exactly gives this relation e gamma is nothing but p gamma into c so this is relativity this is planck einstein okay both of them are completely compatible with maxwell's equations because we started with maxwell's equations the only thing that i did not show you was how to derive the expression for u and pi that is a quite a standard derivation which you can find in the book please trust me with that expression there is nothing wrong with that okay so you see there is a remarkable consistency maxwell's equations in fact gave rise to relativity maxwell's equations in fact gave rise to quantum mechanics because of black body radiation and radiation is nothing but an electromagnetic phenomenon so we can now reinterpret photons to be massless particles so i can cloak assert that photons are massless and this equation tells you that all massless particles move with the speed of light light is one particular example so perhaps i should be able to look at other examples there are indeed such examples to a large extent neutrino is a massless particle you people have heard of neutrino in the beta decay problem this strong interactions when it comes to strong interactions there are particles or gluons which are supposed to move with the speed of light there are what are called as gravitons which appear in gravitation they also move with the speed of light so whatever is massless shall move with the speed of light whatever moves with the speed of light shall be massless that is its rest mass must be equal to zero if its rest mass is equal to zero you will never be able to enter the rest frame of the particle therefore you will always be moving with the speed of light and this is indeed a very very remarkable conclusion that can be drawn by combining maxwell's equations with what by combining maxwell's equations with relativity and quantum mechanics elementary relativity elementary modern physics I mean we are not doing anything more complicated than that 
Now, in order to complete the cycle, what I will do is to stop this discussion for a while and go on to study yet another quintessential wave phenomena, namely interference. As I told you, we do not have the luxury of time to actually discuss interference in all possible aspects. What I will do is to look at the famous prototype experiment. What is that prototype experiment? The famous Young double slit experiment. I will illustrate the principles for you. And then what I will do is to give you examples of interferometers. Please take them as reading assignment and read them. Michelson stellar interferometer, Michelson interferometer, then you have the famous Lloyd's prism, etcetera, etcetera. Okay? You can take those examples. Then I will report to you, I will tell you some very, very remarkable experiments involving interference which when connected with quantum mechanics actually rather which when connected with Planck hypothesis will actually give rise to unbelievable counterintuitive conclusions which led to the development of quantum mechanics and there we will actually conclude the course. So that when you start listening to, when you start studying modern physics, you would have got some kind of a perspective as to how and why modern physics comes about. So let us start look at the interference phenomenon. And as I told you, what I am going to look at is the famous Young's double slit experiment. Okay. In order to discuss Young's double slit experiment, I have to make a diagram, I have to make a nice picture. So, let us try making that. Probably it is good to go to a new page and let me start writing. Okay. So, first of all, I need this slit. So, this is what I have. So, this is my slit 1 and this is my slit S 2. Okay? You have a source of radiation somewhere here. So, you have a source of radiation somewhere here. So, this is your source and these are the two slits. Of course, I have to draw a screen now, which I shall draw here. This is my screen and wherever this source is sitting, let me draw a line and this distance I will call as D rather Z. I think that is a better notation. Let me call it as Z. Actually, I am defining the coordinate system in order to discuss the experimental situation. Now, I am going to choose a point P here and I am asking for the intensity. So, this point P is at a distance x from this point. So, this is 0, 0, this is 0, z and this is x, z. So, this is my z x plane. Now, I have to locate the positions of the slit. So, let me do that now. So, probably a good color will be this. This will be d by 2 okay? and this will be minus d by 2. I am putting a vector here because the position of the slit S 1, this is my slit S 1 and this is my slit S 2 is along the x axis. right? And the axis which connects the source to the screen is the z axis. This is the z x plane. That is what I have chosen. I need a few more geometric objects. So, what I will do is I will take a line and draw this and connect it here. And this is the vector r. Obviously, as all of you know, we are going to assume that the distance between the slates is very small compared to the distance between the slit and the screen. That is the approximation that you are going to make. So, this r is roughly the distance of the point p from the two slits, but not quite so because each of them are displaced with respect to each other. So, I need to draw two more lines. So, let me draw it here. So, I have this which I will call as r 1 and I have this line which I will call as r 2. Please imagine that this is my straight line. Is that part clear to everyone? This is my R 1 
and this is my R2 and this is my R. So, what are the fundamental relations that I have? All of you can check that R1 is R minus D by 2. Please do not forget that D is along the x axis, whereas R2 is simply given by R plus D by 2. Let me emphasize my purpose here is not to discuss interference from the viewpoint of waves as much as to show how to understand interference in terms of the superposition of electromagnetic waves, in particular the electric field vector. Okay. That is the reason why I wrote the expression for the intensity in terms of the electric field vector. What we have to now do is to write down the electric field at the point P. So, I have to write down the electric field at the point P and the electric field at the point P is by the principle of superposition coming from this and coming from this. right? That is, this will be E 1 of P plus E 2 of P. What is E 1? E 1 is the electric field which came from the secondary source S 1, that is the slit S 1 and E 2 is the electric field which owes its origin to the slit S 2, that is what we have. So, if I know how to write down the electric field corresponding to this and the electric field corresponding to this, then we know how to add it up. So, let us start doing that. So, what is it that I have? I have E 1 is nothing but, so let me write a vector E naught, then I am going to write cos of, now I should be careful with what I am going to write, k 1 dot r minus d by 2, everyone can see this minus omega t. I have the direction of the electric field, that is what I have and then my electric field E 2 will be given by electric field E 2 will be so given by, I need a better notation. So, what I shall do is to introduce E bar. So, E naught bar coming from the second slit into cos k 2 dot r plus d by 2 minus omega t. So, you have the E 1 and you have the E 1 naught. So, probably a better notation instead of the bar would be, let us improve upon our notation. I will call this as E 1 naught and I will call it as E 2 naught. The naught refers to the amplitude, 1 and 2 refers to the source. What are k 1 and k 2? k 1 is the direction of propagation from slit x 1 propagation from s 1 and k 2 is the direction of propagation from s 2 and if I were to indicate this, my k 1 is parallel to r 1, k 2 is parallel to r 2. So, that is what we have. So, these are the two directions of propagations and we have to plug these expressions. Fine. Now, we need a few more geometric concepts. So, let me start introducing them. These are all quite simple. So, what I will do is, let me draw a line here and let me denote this angle by alpha. Let me draw a line here and let me denote this angle by beta. So, when I am going to look at the components of R 1 and R 2 or correspondingly k 1 and k 2, what I have to do is to express k 1 and k 2 in terms of the corresponding alpha and beta. So, what will be the expression for k 1 and k 2? That is the question that we are asking. So, let us start writing down. You people can easily see that n 1 is nothing but cos alpha sin alpha and n 2 is nothing but cos beta sin beta. So, how am I writing this? What I am doing is, I have my z x plane, that is the reason why I am writing two dimensional vector and I am saying this is my alpha. 
So, n 1 is cos alpha sin alpha, similarly n 2 is cos beta sin beta. What we have to now do is to actually try to see the difference between these expressions. Okay. But once you give me this, I know how to write down my expression for cos alpha and sin alpha because of the geometry which I introduced in this particular figure. So, you people can see what is my cos alpha that is nothing but z divided by root of r squared r 1 squared and similarly for beta. So, let me go back to this page and let me write down the expression. So, what will be my cos alpha? My cos alpha will be simply given by z over z square plus x minus d by 2 whole square. Pythagoras theorem sin alpha will be x minus d by 2 divided by 2 by half whatever was here will come here. Now, let me look at the corresponding expression for cos beta. What will this be? This will be the same thing z over root z square plus x plus d by 2 whole square and sin beta you can write similar expression complete this. Now, let us not forget what our approximation was. Our approximation was that z is much, much greater than x and d. Is that part okay? z is much, much greater than x plus minus d by 2 and if you did that, you will find that alpha approximately equal to beta. You do not have to make any distinction between r 1 and r 2. So, what we are going to now do is to replace r 1 is approximately equal to r 2. Is that right? So, let me illustrate that in the picture again. So, you had your r unit vector r here, this was your r 1 and this was your r 2. We are saying that these angles are so small. So, we are saying that r 1 approximately equal to r 2 approximately equal to r. We are not going to make any distinction. So, if you remember this long distance approximation that the screen is quite far, far away, then it is a very simple exercise for us to write down the total expression for the electric field at the point P. So, what is my electric field now? That is nothing but E 1 0 cos K 1 dot r minus omega t plus e 2 0 cos k 2 dot r minus omega t. We do not bother about what happens to that, but we keep track of the signs of k 1 and k 2, the tutorial sign behind k 1 and k 2. So, what do we conclude? If the angles are roughly the same, we will have Roughly speaking, n 1 parallel to n 2 parallel to n. That is, we make no great distinction between k 1 and k 2. So, we shall now write the total field to be E 1 0 cos. Now, notice what I am going to do k dot r minus d by 2 minus omega t that is I have put k 1 approximately equal to k 2 approximately equal to k 2 plus e 2 0 cos k dot r plus d by 2 minus omega t big bracket. The rest of it is now standard. I am interested in the intensity coming from the electric field and this is something that you should notice. If I had a stream of particles, the energy would have been additive, the total energy would have been E 1 plus E 2 plus E 3, but from the simple principle of superposition, energy is not additive, but amplitude is additive, the field is additive. So, what do I get? I get the total intensity is given by, apart from a multiplicative constant whatever epsilon naught, let me look at the energy. I will have E 1 0 squared plus E 2 0 squared. As usual, I am doing the 
time averages. Now comes the most important expression 2 e 1 0 dot e 2 0 into the product of the two causes, which I am going to examine in at some length. And all of us will recognize this quantity, all of us will rec recognize this quantity to be the famous interference term. And now you see, whatever observation the experimentalists, the optics people had done falls right into the place, because if E 1 0 is perpendicular to E 2 0, then there is no interference. right? So, E 1 perpendicular to E 2 means no interference. So, all that remains for me is to actually explore the consequences of these two cost products and show the bright and the dark fringes which you are familiar with, which I will do in one minute. Then after that, what I would like to do is to describe an experiment involving interference exactly the same top setup, but with some polarizers and analyzers thrown in that will throw you a lot of surprise. That is what is called as a single photon interference experiment and I will show you some remarkable results and tell you why and how actually what we call as quantum physics or modern physics comes about and then we will conclude the course and that we will leave for the next lecture.